start with a little bit of background. Uh, I was uh, uh, on the board here at what used to be called Disjecta about 10 or 12 years ago. I loved it. And so when you look at that QR code, if you give, that would be most appreciated because they do a really good job here. So Dustin, tell them to do it again whenever you get a chance. Okay? Okay. At the end of it, tell them, you have to tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So, uh, I also wanna say a couple of things about Willie. This young man is a crazy good artist. He's a good person. Julian is a crazy good person and a good artist. And when you get that combination, it's a really good thing. So I'm so happy to know both of them. I've visited both of their studios. I've had dinner with William, with Willie. I haven't had dinner with Tiffany and Julian, so that's a little prompt there. So remember that, <laughs> Tiffany. Uh, I just want to say, Willie and I went to the same university, University of North Carolina, about 300 years ago. Yes, And for sure. at that time, there was two and a half to three percent of African Americans there. And we didn't even know each other, which is crazy. But uh, with, since we were both here in Portland, we've gotten to know each other. And I love his work and been following him. And he'll tell you a little bit more about his background, but they are absolutely similar. <laughs> That's my grandma's house in there. Everything you see in there, my grandma had. So that's, you were just out on cue, you curated it beautifully. Thank Julia, you, I appreciate it. this young man here, I met a while ago, went out to his studio, uh, Nico Fern, I see he just showed up. He invited me to come out and see Julian's studio and I was honored to do that. Um, I was able to add something to our collection. Thank you very much for being so kind to me. Um, and also I learned that he is from Chicago and he's out here changing the way we see art and the way we do art. Uh, he's been out to Nike a whole bunch, so folks will know him from out there. And we'll get started. I'm going to start with their childhood. We'll talk a little bit, and then I'll ask you for a few questions, and then I'll ask them to ask each other a question. And then we'll have more time. We'll get back to you. But first of all, Willie, tell us about your childhood, where you grew up, and what kind of things in that area influenced the work that you have. And then we'll go to you, Julian. Okay. Okay, John, I grew up. Everyone, hello. It's good to see everybody here. I grew up in uh, the Pactolis Township of Little Washington, North Carolina. They called it Little because it wasn't, it wasn't Washington, D.C. It was always, always uh, a place to, to distinguish between the two. But uh, we grew up on a tobacco farm, and we grew up poor, but my father had a little uh, illegal liquor house uh, that was a grocery store by day and an illegal liquor house at night. And everything about my childhood was, it was inspired by how I grew up. Um, one of the things that, it, the, the beginning of my career when I decided that I was going to make art, I tried to make, I tried to make work that tried to make sense out of who, who I am and where I come from. And it all stemmed from when I was six years old, I remembered the 4th of July, 1968. I discovered that my mother was not my real mother, and, and that my young aunt, who was visiting from uh, New York, was my real birth mother. And I made the mistake of telling a little girl who was five years old that this woman, uh, my aunt, was, my, was not my real mother. And that, and my, uh, my, my birth, and my mother overheard it, and it hurt her feelings. And she told me that that same night, when I was going to the, in the kitchen to pick up, to get some Kool-Aid. <laughs> and she told- Was it grape Kool-Aid? It was grape Kool-Aid, yep. thank you for- tend to like Yes, we, we love grape Kool-Aid. But the thing is, the hurt feelings I saw on her face um, shocked me as a six-year-old. I didn't know how to process it, that, but I knew that at that moment I was gonna make up her, those hurt feelings for the rest of my life. And I decided to make work that celebrated where I came from. And I did that for the first 20 years. And um, the sense of humor, the making, uh, making lemonade out of lemons, all comes from my grandmother who had a really, really wicked sense of humor. I use that in, in my work. And everything that's rustic and rough hewn, uh, this whole country uh, rural aesthetic comes from how I make art and it all uh, goes back to my 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 humble beginnings, and I always celebrate that. 
But the unfortunate, the, the great thing about it is that I finally decided to be proud of it after I uh, moved to Charlotte after I graduated from college. So moved to a big city. I moved to a big city, and and because I, I used to be ashamed of that, so it was all about releasing that shame, and that's how my work was has always been inspired by where I come from. Thank you, Willie. Willie and I grew up in the, the rural North Carolina area, and we used to call it, as Willie has in, his, uh, in the show there, the sticks. Uh, that means you're from the country. And when you went to Charlotte, you were going to a big city. The big city. city. It was amazing to get there. Saw shopping malls and all kinds of fun stuff. Absolutely. Julian, tell us about your upbringing, where you grew up, and how those, that place influenced you. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everyone. Um, I grew up in Chicago on the south side. <clears throat> I think my church family and I growing up in the in a church um, was very transformative, important, um, in shaping me as an artist. I grew up in a, a church whose our, our our saying was or the mantra was unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. And so, growing up hearing um, a juxtaposition of you know political very conscious stories, but intertwined with the Bible. Um, and then me being an artist um, and seeing in pictures really helped shape how my storytelling. Um, my father is an artist. So I think because my, fa my parents divorced when I was a young age, um, being a, because I, know, I knew that my artistic talent, the really better, the better percentage of it stemmed from my father. That was like my connectiveness to him. Um, and so very early on, some of our exercises would be like, he taught me how to draw eyes. And so like, even now at 30 years old, you know, there, I, I, I really focus a lot on the eyes and just the emotion that's conveyed through eyes just in my work. And it's just a nod and like a, more of a silent nod to my father. Um, and even my, I was telling uh, Willie earlier, like my penmanship stemmed from my mother. She writes calligraphy. And so I used to like sit over her shoulder and try to write like her because I had a theory growing up, like I was in like third or fourth grade. And you know, you have a girlfriend at that age and now she probably has like four or five boyfriends. And so I had a theory that how would she read my note twice <laughs> if she's got six other notes to read. <laughs> and so I figured if my handwriting was the best, then I had a better chance of her reading my note yeah. again. And so just th those things and those silly moments just as an artist and just growing up, they just helped me kind of come into my own. And um, but when I reflect back, I say just coming from Chicago, and the influence within the culture, growing up in a church that had black art, black stained glass art. My father's a stained glass artist, so I grew up understanding the importance of investing in one's work, um, investing in your materials, because if you know stained glass, the glass is not cheap. And so I just, I learned these things very early on. And, you know, my father never made money as an artist. And he never, you know, he never told me that I could be successful as an artist because it's not something that is in the black community or in a black household. It's just, it's very uh, ambitious, yep. almost Absolutely. more ambitious than trying to go play professional sports. Yeah. Yes, for sure. And, um, and so like even to this day, like even just going and pursuing art in college and getting my degree in drawing and painting, I did that to be like, okay, dad, look, like I can figure out a way to monetize my degree and show that what you gave me, I've been able to make worth talking about. Yeah. Thank you, Julian. Uh, one thing I like about Julian is um, one of his, one of the Instagram posts that I love most is of you in the Louvre. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at this giant painting. I don't know if it was Peter Paul Rubens. Or it was the Wrath of Medusa. Of somebody. See, he knows. I don't. So he was looking at this, and he was really, really looking. And what we have at the museum, uh, uh, Sarah, our curator of cont contemporary and modern art, is here, and Sid, uh, Carrie, my boss, is here. And they know this. We have supporters who help us. They give us funds to do the work that we do. And we try, we buy black art like this. 
and they wonder what's going on. And I'm like, this picture, your picture on Instagram is what I can use to show. This guy is looking at this work and then he's gonna make something from this. And that's where the, the source is. So thank you for doing that. That helps me with my job. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> now, I wanna ask you this. So if people don't know about your background, uh, start with you, Julian. Can you tell us like your training and if there was an artist that you have emulated or someone who has inspired you and how that artist might influence your work? And then Willie, Willie will ask okay. you after that. Okay. So I, I pursued art in college and I got my, I got a degree in drawing and painting and then I got a minor in PE and coaching because my mom was like, how are you going to, are you gonna make money as an artist? <laughs> What's that? Right, yeah. and um, she was like, well, at least you can fall back and be a gym teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, you're, you're right. I mean, coaches, you really only need one good teacher to wanna to stay in school. And so I always felt there's importance with the education. And I was like, okay, that'd be great that I could one day be a teacher. But as far as like upbringing and training, like, you know, in college, I played football. So it was incredibly difficult to balance being in the studio and on the field. And so it wasn't until I tore my labrum the second time that I really got to hone in on the craft of painting and just get out of the timidness of being afraid of using oil and all of these other mediums. And, um, you know, just even to the point of like what you're saying, go to the Louvre, a lot of the training is like self-taught. So like the artists that I look up to, I treat them like, like professors that I got to pick. Mm -hmm. You know, at any certain time I'm creating a body of work. So if I'm drawing from Benny Andrews or, you know, Robert Colescott or, you know, Jasper Johns, you know, I'm treating them like you're getting to pick your course load and then I get to pick what, how, what I want to take from them, you know, and, and, and how I could not necessarily, not really at all copy what they're doing, but rather have a, a conversation like a drink at the bar, yeah. you know? And, and so even with the Under the Flag body of work, it's really a conversation with, you know, Benny Andrews and, and Jasper Johns. It's like Jasper Johns used the flag as a medium, but it's like, well, if we lift up the flag and see what's underneath. Yeah, love mm -hmm. that. Really, tell us about uh, your training and any artists that might have influenced okay. you and how it's yeah. affecting your work. It's so funny that Julian had the, uh, we have a very similar story about, you know, the whole black thing in art. <laughs> so we, I was, a, I, I was at UNC Chapel Hill and one of my homegirls, uh, we were talking, she was, a, she was a junior and she said, well, Willie, what is your major? She, I said, it's art. She was like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> and I, she said, well, how do you think, how are you gonna make any money off of that? You need to try something else. She was a communications major. And she uh, urged me to, to uh, pursue that. So I actually continued to take art courses, uh, but also uh, majored in communications. But the thing, the thing about that, I think it really did help me in both ways, because I was a poor communicator. I could not, I, I had, I had to put lipstick on the pig or lipstick on the hall uh, after at, while I was there because I came, I did come from the sticks. So all of that kind of came and culminated and, and made me the artist who I am as a storyteller, as a person who uses my voice to tell stories and, and fill in the blanks. Uh, so I, there are three artists who have inspired me. One is Renee Stout. I love her use of objects um, and her painterly uh, techniques. And she's a really beautiful soul and she has some kind of witchery in her <laughs> work. But the other, the other one is Betty Saar. And Betty Saar, she and I have a very spiritual connection to uh, objects. Uh, both of us, I, I know I can count, conjure them up. Uh, for ex for example, the the uh, the outside of the shack, uh, I knew when I was trying to. Uh, I knew but my fa my my family's house was a green shingled shotgun shack, and I know that, and it was green asbestos shingles. I know that those were not you, those are not cooled, and they don't make them anymore. But I knew that. Portland was full of wood shingles and I wanted to find lime green, lime green, lime green. And I'm like, where's, where am I gonna find lime green? I went to the Rebuild Center, 
No. And I and I and I and I befriended a sister and I said, Can you, you know, call me when something comes in and months pass and nothing happened? But then I go to reclaim it uh, at the eleventh hour and walk uh, walk through the door and I look to the side and there is a box of wood shingles and I turn it and they are green and I get chills. Oh, wow. <laughs> then I walk, as I said, are there any more? She said, oh yeah, they're in the back. I go in the back mm. and there was enough to do the front. But the other, other thing that I was pining or, or pain in pain trying to find was a swing for the front porch. So a friend of mine, Malia Jensen, was you know looking in her neighborhood. She yeah. said, "I found, yeah. I found a swing," and we went to the swing. It was it was raggedy. And I'm like, uh -huh. "No, I don't. I, I'm not." You know. And then we didn't know how we were going to get it. And I and I told the universe, I said, "Wait a minute. I know I'm going to find the swing." So good back to reclaim it. I'm walking through, getting the shingles, and walk by the swing that was someone had just brought in wow. that day. Wow. I even walked by it twice and didn't even see it. And then I walked back. And the thing about it is when I'm in the zone, I always have to take time. So I took time. I'm like, let me go back in and do another sweep. And I went in and there it was. And they told me it came in minutes wow. before. So that day was a crazy day. But that happens to me a lot. And, I, and with that, I know that I'm on the right path when that happens. And the other artist is uh, a man named John Outerbridge. John Outerbridge was, is from North Carolina, and he has a very rustic uh, technique, uh, very similar to mine. And I ended up meeting him in Oakland in 2010. It was at this, uh, he had a solo ex exhibition, and I saw the work and I was, I was like, man, I just really dig it. And I dig the fact that you're from North Carolina. And he, I said, yes, I said, yes. Yeah. So uh, come visit me in LA sometimes. I went, to, I went to his studio and we started talking because I still was just, I hadn't put it together because I was just so in awe of him. I said, um, John, you're from Greenville, right? And he said, yeah. I said, now, when I was in the third and fourth grade, there was a teacher who looked like um, Curtis Mayfield, which was all really hip and with the glasses. And his last name was Outerbridge. He taught me the third and fourth grade. Do you think, do you, are you, would you happen to be related to him? He said, you know, yeah, that's my brother. Wow. And, you know, and he said, let me call him. Let's see if he's home. Uh -huh. And I called, uh, he called him, he said, uh, brother, I have Willie Lilla on the phone, I mean, here, and he said that you taught him in the third and fourth grade, and he, he said, I want to put you on the phone. Wow. And then I, 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 was in, I was emotional because I said, you actually made me want to be an artist because I saw a person of color making art. He said, well, thank you so much, young man. I really appreciate that. But that was such a validating moment. But it, it does speak to the whole thing about the challenges of being black and yeah. being an artist and the stigma behind or, or the fear. Yeah. I love the stories. I love Thank it. You. Thank you for Thank sharing you. that. I also want to let you know, Willie, I have my grandmother's porch swing in storage in North Carolina if you ever need another. Oh, one. really? That's yes. so, that is so wild. Yeah, I got you. OK. okay. Also, <laughs> I, you just, you, when you do your paintings and your work, you use a lot of painting and assemblage and collage and adding a whole bunch of stuff. How does that work in the studio? When you're in the studio, do you paint something and look, step back and say, hey, this needs some other stuff? Or do you do you draft that all out initially and have a sketch? Tell me okay, okay. But I, I also want to say Jasper Johns was one of, is one of my, is, you know, there's a definitely an influence with that because mm -hmm. using using the flag, using objects too. But when I make uh, make assemblage pieces, it's really uh, it's really funny. I will collect objects that speak to me without a plan. I, I will have a studio filled with a group filled with things. For example, the piece the piece that is at the Portland Art Museum, the one with uh, called. Um, uh, official NRA target. I was at a, I was at a flea market in North Carolina, Klein's Country Antiques, mm -hmm. and this man, this old old Goldwyn man, had all it was an acres of stuff. So I found, I started collecting the things. And I found an, uh, a toy M60, um, and a an official 
a document signed by an NRA, an NRA member and an Iron Eagle and uh, some shell uh, casings. And I'm like, I ended up just collecting all kinds of things because I had guns on the brain. But then when I found, when I, I had my bobblehead dolls and I started assembling things and I'm like, oh wow, this is, this, this is definitely gonna be the story about the NRA and that, that you know, we, they, we have a target on our backs. Uh, with the with the gun, with issues of guns, and so that's how I kind of did that. A lot of times, I will create work, and it will have lots of layers. But that only comes after I have just I don't know. It's something about taking the objects and seeing a, a something in um, seeing a possibility, and the and the the symbols, the metaphors, all those things are just really crazy. That I, that I can come up with them after the fact. Cause right, it, right. So that's kind of my process. And, and so with, uh, with abstract paintings, I will also uh, just start, let, the, let nature take its course and it just yeah. work. But these, these, this painting, uh, those two paintings are mine, but the one I meant to tell you, with the story about my mother being, I am not your, my mama, uh, that piece was created to tell the story about that day I hurt my mother's feelings and it changed both of our lives. Yeah. Uh, and this piece, uh, I've just started going back to making figurative work, but that one uh, is just another, oh, uh, my love for the black woman, the real black woman, the woman with the knowing eyes, the woman who has raised America for many, many years, the woman that needs respect. The, and the, la and the, the red in the background represents the bloodshed unnecessarily through hate and gun violence and all kinds of things. And the shells have uh, are dinkra symbols mm -hmm. that, are, that have many, many meanings of strength and resilience. So that is uh, my process and how it has evolved. Thank you, Willie. The, I see a, a, a theme. Both of you have guns and gun violence in your work. Can you tell us a little bit, Julian, about your process of the assemblage and collage and all that? Do you start with just the painting and add, or do you have it all kind of figured out? So it really depends on which way I'm going. Um, for the piece, um, the newer Jim Crow with the two, the cans and the um, the paintbrushes. That piece, like when I um, I pray for creative direction. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a bit of grace and patience that's needed when creating work. And so with for that piece in sp specifically, you know, being an artist is lonely, so you spend a lot of time by yourself with your works or just with the process, and you come up with outlandish just thoughts and just what if situations. So one of them that I was thinking of was like, who has all of Francis Bacon's paintbrushes? <laughs> I was like, yo, where are all the dried up paintbrushes? And I was like, man, that'd be crazy. You imagine going in an antique store, because I get the antique yeah, bug too, yeah, and that's yeah, real. Yeah, it's that's real. real. It's a sign yeah. in those antique stores that really says you will catch the bug, and that's real. You, yeah. you end up spending $700 yeah. on things. Yeah. And, um, on stuff. And it, it doesn't matter what age you are either. You go in there and just find stuff. Um, and so I was like, man, what if you go to an antique store and you find Jean Michel's old paintbrushes? It's like, wow, wouldn't that be something? I was like, I bet you people would probably put that up in a glass case on their wall and be like, yo, it's almost like getting Harry Potter's wand if yeah. you think about it, right? right? And so I just started to, you know, so put that on the shelf. And then for me as an artist, sometimes like I work, and I work across a number of mediums. So I use house paint. Um, when I first started painting, um, I couldn't afford paint. And it just wasn't like, not that I was like that poor or nothing like that. It was just like, I'm a kid. 
-hmm. I can't afford paint. So I don't have a yeah. job. Yeah. Like, right. you know, and the paint that your parents are going to provide for you is not <laughs> Blick level paint. <laughs> you know, it's like, yo, I got a half a can of wall paint. Yeah. You can yeah. go do what you like. And um, here's these little small little tinker paint things yeah. that you can also figure out. And so I started using, thankfully for real estate, we were talking about yeah. earlier, my family renovating houses only in real estate, they have all these leftover wall paint cans. And so I, just as a connectedness to home, I, I, I just love seeing paint cans, whether they be dried. I have a picture of me as a child with a paint can. And it, I just, I, I don't know, it's just a nod to like coming up and just like, like home. And so I started to just put the paint, the dried brushes from me standing in the studio and not washing brushes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because who wants to wash brushes? Just, just <laughs> yep. go buy new brushes if you can. You <laughs> That's know. Yeah. Hire an assistant. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't we haven't sold that many paintings yet. Yeah. Though. So um, no, but what I'm saying um, when I was just collecting them, I I, I separated. I was like, okay. This can is already separated from my colored water. Mm -hmm. So for your colored brushes, so you don't mix them up, and you're, you're my white brushes, or the white water. And so mm -hmm. I sat back and I, I looked at the tape, and they were sitting together, and you get all the brushes yes. in there because yeah. you got all these brushes. You yep. got all the black brushes in the thing already. Yep. You got, all, and I'm like, colored only, damn. whites only. I, damn, I That's love that. Piece. Yeah. That's a piece. That's a piece. And so let the water dry out. And it became a piece. And so that's just the patience because it, it, it wasn't like it was, oh, yeah, like I'm going to go in and create this. It was it just really manifests. It was like it, it, it grew out of the studio, out of the process. Now, other paintings and other works are a bit more intentional. And so, mm -hmm. like, I may see, like when I was watching Bamboozled and I got um, really reintroduced and, and re-immersed in the, um, Michael Ray Charles's work. Mm -hmm. And just him doing the creative direction for the art direction for Bamboozled and the paintings being very like intentionally placed in certain scenes. And I remember I watched it immediately back to back because I watched it at 30 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, it came out in 2000. I was born in 91. So at nine, I'm not watching Bamboozled. Right. <laughs> Thank you, mom, for not letting me watch Bamboozled. But it was more of at 30, I was able to understand it and just understand what how culture was and how that how amazing of a painting Spike Lee created mm -hmm. with that movie and how hyper relevant it is even to this day. And so I'm looking at Michael Ray Charles' work and I was just like, wow. I've never seen anybody talking with this narrative and from this vantage point and it connects to what I'm seeing from Oregon's history. And I was like, well, What, what if he, just like he, he took a 20 year hiatus. Mm -hmm. So that made me think like for 20 years, people weren't talking about this, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And so it's like, all right, I, I need to put myself in, I can't be critical and not constructive. And so it's like, let me learn more about this and then what, what, where this stands foundationally in American history. Yeah, cool. I, uh, yes, sir. I also wanted to add to what you just said about patience. You're gonna have patience. a chance to ask a question. No, but, uh, but you talked about patience. And that there, you have to have, be patient. And there, there are some other paintings that I didn't put on, uh, that I do oxidation paintings, they're abstract. And there's an, uh, a, a rusting technique using patina, patinas. Uh, and I have to be patient and treat it like a baby and tend to it. And because it oxidizes over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So you can't mess with uh, it. Yeah. So over time, I have to wait and see what happens. And if what like happens that. is- Like that. What, well, yeah, because the, the doll does have the oxidation. Yeah. But I do have, I do abstract paintings. That, but it's, it is funny that you have to, you can't be impatient because I have tried it and it doesn't work. Yeah. When you have to. The, I wonder, there's the piece that Julia was talking about. Yeah. And I think Martha said that she's gotten bunches and bunches of calls for that piece, but it's actually sold already. So, congratulations. Yeah. But another theme that I see in both of your work is that you use some racist imagery. You use the black face, and I liked it to show you even had some of the black paint that uh, Al Jolson and people would use to do that. 
and uh, Willie uses pickaninnies and glitter and all kinds of amazing things to make his work cool. And just trying to figure out when you do that, are you looking at the historical images or the history behind them? Are you looking at the current racism against us or are you looking at the, the you know, just, are you thinking about what that means to the world today? What, I don't even, what, what are you thinking when you're doing that? Uh, all three. All of that. Because the thing is, it's all about claim it so you won't be a sh claim it to re to diffuse the shame, to take all the power out of it, and that is one of the things that we do so well as a group. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that with a lot of work, especially with the do with the dolls. I have taken a very racist doll that was made in the. 1950s made in Japan, marketed to white America for as a joke. They they were all they're all black Piccanini bobblehead doll banks. And when I saw the first one at, at a flea market in uh, Charlotte, I said, "Oh!" And then I said, "Oh," because it was so <laughs> precious and looked like Betty Boop and all that. But then it it all the all the other connotations behind that made me say, "I want that." And if I can and if I could have if I were a rich man. I would buy every single one of them, so none of them would go on the on the mantelpieces to reminisce the days gone by. So I decided that I would reclaim them and represent them. So then there's another thing about documenting history, because if you don't document it, if you don't understand it, then you'll forget it. So many young people don't know what happened. And, and I think as an artist, it is great for us to document and, 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 call, and call things out as we see them. So that is, it's all three. And you're doing it very well. Oh, I appreciate yes. that. Julia, tell us about why you use those images. Well, to be black is to be painfully positive. So yeah. when I say that, that means like, you, as a black man, we don't get to, or black people don't get to not be black. Like you don't get to turn it on and off based on what information and things that we're experiencing. And so for me, you know, as an artist, I've always been interested in making conversation pieces. Those were the most intriguing to me. That's what I grew up around. And that's what I would see in institutions and museums and schools. And, you know, with me creating like the, the blackface paste and digging into the history, like all of that stemmed from what I'm immersed in currently, like what's around me. So I learned about Coon Chicken Inn mm -hmm. on Sandy Boulevard by just learning about Oregon's history. Well, that led me to dig further. And then when I'm watching Bamboozle and I see the Coon Chicken Inn logo in the background behind Mantan, it's like it all starts to make sense. And so, you know, I feel as artists, you know, it's a blessing to be an artist. T to be able to create something from nothing is a, is a sheer blessing. And, you know, I feel that activism is the rent I pay for being an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love that. So it's more like I don't have a choice to what I get to paint about. Yeah. Right. Because Gil Scott Heron didn't just solely speak or sing about certain things or the ha most happiest of things or imagine that Nina Simone never created, you know, blood on, the, I mean, um, you know, uh, 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 um, a strange fruit, strange fruit yeah. you know, which led to blood on the leaves with Kanye. You just mm -hmm. think about like the, the, the passing down of stories. And, you know, I, I always think about the education system, you know, I'm a little bit older because I'm 30 now, you know, so <laughs> I just, I, I, I think. Right. It's not old compared to Willie and me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think back um, to school and how I really enjoy history class and especially black history and going to a predominantly white institution, my history, black history teacher was a white person. And so that's quite bizarre when you sit back and zoom back and you got to only assume that a bit of history is not really being told. Mm -hmm. And so I feel with there being kickback and omission for, of, of certain details within 
American history. It's like I'm not I'm painting American history. Mm -hmm. um, it's our job as artists to evade that by painting about these things. Yeah, it's not <laughs> like you invented blackface. Right. I definitely didn't. No. That that was not me. Right. You know? yeah. But 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 T D Rice created Jim Crow. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and that's a minstrel character. And so mm -hmm. when in twenty twenty two and I'm asking people like, do you know what do you when you think of Jim Crow, what do you know? And you th they say, oh, Jim Crow laws and Dr. King. Yeah. And then you zoom back and then you see in Newburgh, a teacher going to school in blackface to protest yeah. mass mandates. Yeah. It's like, wow. So the story of Jim Crow and its really conception and it's on a, st on a, on a stage mm -hmm. has still not been told in its true sense. And it's like, right. okay, we're skipping a step by just painting by, by just focusing on Burt Williams and the other black actors that had to wear blackface to get on stage. Right. It's like, no, Al Jolson did not have to wear blackface. Yeah, right. You right. know, yeah. the birth of the nation did not have to put out the, the story and the narrative that it did that is still affecting black men and women to this day. And so that's just how I feel. Like, I feel there's an obligation. And I mean, that's, that's that mortgage I pay. Absolutely. Yeah. It, is, it is our... It is our burden and it is, is our responsibility as artists of color to tell, uh, to tell our stories and to actually inspire people. And this is what we were put on our own earth to do. We, I know that this is my, this is my and your, it, like you just said, it, it, it is it's how we pay. But it really is, we are a special breed. And I think artists, of all sorts have, were put on this earth to heal because we definitely, where we are today is a really interesting place because we are in this social and cultural awakening. Yeah. And people want to put the genie back in the bottle. Bitch, it is out of the bottle <laughs> and you can't put it back. And that is so important. The train is still moving. So I, and, I, and I celebrated that and I love that. And that is one of the reasons why I felt, because it's all about timing too. Because people always ask, I had someone ask me, why, why have you never made work about your sexuality? I said, well, actually I thought it was just kind of given. I am gay and, I'm, and most of my, sto my storylines have a kind of a nod to all of that. But I still thought about it. I said, if I have the, uh, the one opportunity, I would tell this story that I had been writing all my life, ever since I, I saw that, that, that in my own little corner, in my own little chair, I can be whatever I want to be. In 1965, I'm like, that's me. That's a misfit. That's an outcast. That's a person who has always been felt like other and not respected. And finally, I can tell the story, but the time is now. And I think that that time, the timing was absolutely poignant and, and, and correct. So that is why I'm so proud and grateful that Blake approached me and this piece came together. Thank you, Willie. I appreciate that. The, uh, and another thing I appreciate about you gents uh, is that you are putting this out there for the world to see. 15, maybe 17 years ago, uh, Oregonian called me. They wanted to take a look at my collection and stuff like that. And they wanted to come and photograph it for one of those interior things they do. And, uh, and I have the Andy Warhol Mammy and I have a whole bunch of other black memorabilia. Mm -hmm. Nope, didn't want to show any of that. They showed all the other landscapes and yeah. ceramics and crap and stuff. So anyway, it's thank about, you for it's doing about it. Timing. They would like to see it, I hope. Yeah, right. Thank you. I want to ask you this. Um, you gentlemen have a major successes right now. You have the Creative Heights grant that made you possible for the Contemporary Museum to show your show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. And um, you have a show at the museum right now on the fourth floor at the Portland Art Museum. Please come see it. It's amazing. And Julian has been amazing things. He was a, a full page color article in the Sunday New York Times a few Sundays ago. He's been on the cover of New York Magazine. Had a show in New York. 
have done well at auction. Works have already been auctioned off and also having their show at Russo Lee up on 21st. Please go see it. It's crazy stuff. But anyway, you've done this good stuff. Now what? What are you going to do? What's the next thing? Julian, what are you going to be working on? Um, <clears throat> for me, I want to explore just a body of work around Vanport mm -hmm. and just tell the Vanport story as it relates to Oregon. I've, um, I found it very interesting and um, Does everybody know the Van Port story? You want to tell us a little bit? Um, well, I think I think Google will be able to tell a lot better <laughs> than I could, um, as I'm still, you know, want to build out the body of work and just the storylines. But essentially, Van Port was a part of Portland, about a part of Oregon, where really black people were restricted and confined to live, and there happened to be a flood that destroyed the city within minutes that they did not get the black, the people of the black and white people of the town, but the majority of the black people did not get in a, a warning about. And um, one of the first places that black people and white people actually live together. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I got exposed to Vanport by going to the car shows at Portland Raceway. Yeah because I, I enjoy the car shows and just, you know, and, and so I'm looking at this area and then I, I go by the plaque that is the remembrance and it just, it led me to think that, you know, there are more stories to be told. And so that's where I think that after I take a fishing break, I'll yeah. probably go and start good, painting good. about. You deserve it. I look forward to seeing that. That's got to be powerful. Willie, what's up? Well, I, I, have, I took, a, took stock in my career and I just started looking at how every time I did something with scale to it, things kind of popped off. Mm -hmm. The first exhibit I created that was seriously taken was a juke joint, and, I'm, and it was a recreation of my father's illegal liquor house, and it's, uh, it's in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian, but it started off as with small vignettes. The second one was uh, a 20-foot tall ghetto fabulous clan hood, oh, how fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, so now I'm thinking about scale with the bobblehead dolls. Can you imagine some scale big ass how, how big? Double, how big. bobblehead dolls? How, but how big? Well, why don't you just ask? Come on, you just think. I mean, what, how, do you, how could, what would the biggest, could, could you imagine the biggest doll be? 20 feet. Okay. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, not in my price range, but okay. But you know, and I and I want the head to bobble too. It's, oh, there was a bobble head, wow. anyway. So that's what I'm thinking. I love it. I love it. I look forward to seeing. And, and anyone who knows uh, how I can get the funding for that, yeah. please <laughs> talk to me. Call Willie. Now I want you to ask Willie a question if you have something you've been wanting to ask him. And Willie, I want you to ask Julian a question. And then I'm oh. going to come to you folks to so start okay. thinking. I mean, we're to have oh. about time for three <laughs> no, questions. No. Okay. No, no. Um, how do you deal with the creative block? It's so funny. I, I haven't had a creative block in a long time because there's so much material of, with what's going on. But I tell you, when I, one of the things that does help me is a long drive. And when I, a long drive with, on my own with the music playing, my favorite music, be it Mary J. Blige or whoever, <laughs> and then stuff starts, starts happening right. it, because it's, there's, no, there's no distraction. I'm looking at the beautiful nature all around me, and then things just, I mean, I can really think. And also, in the middle of the night, around two or three, if, I, if I'm, I'm having a block, I will just things start popping, coming to me, and I, and, and I can see more cl with more clarity. So that is a magical are, hour. Yeah, it's very, yeah, it very is, magical. It is. Yeah, Willie, anything for Julian? Well, I wanted to know, because we started talking about the, your use of the flag. Yes. Tell me, talk about what that flag means, because I just Thank love, you. yeah. So... In, the flag became a, a medium within the work just by driving from home. So like you said, to evade the creative block and driving from Beaverton to Forest Grove where my studio is. And so I'd see at least, and this is just an understatement, I see at least 70 
flags of, in various places. And you, you, once you start noticing one, you become hyper aware of them. And so, mm -hmm. you know, as an artist, you know, you observe and you take in and somewhat like you were saying about collage, like other things become start to become a medium. Mm -hmm. And so they're almost like experiences are almost like found objects, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm like driving and I'm, every day I'm just seeing flags. I'm like, oh, wow, this, this house just put up two new flags in front of the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wow. They own mm. the flag. Yeah, or or sometimes this yeah. one this one house changes from the the Blue Lives Matter flag yeah. to the to the American flag. Yeah. I, I think it depends on what the neighbors oh, say. Yeah. I I can't decide, yeah. Yeah. you know, but um I it's, know. it's almost it's it it started to like make me see the flag differently, right? Yeah. And um in an attempt to deal with one of my paintings, the the cop and the clan hood. I covered the painting with the flag. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh wow, I think I have a, a piece. And then mm -hmm. from there, you know, it continued to build out. But like really it's just, it was the long drives and just seeing it so many times, going to car shows and, and, and battleground and seeing a parade of pickup trucks with flags coming out. Yep. And I'll say one thing about that. It is disrespectful to the United States if you do not have two flags sticking out the back evenly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anytime you see a, a truck and they only got one flag and they think they're being very patriotic, yeah. no, they're actually being disrespectful because a part of my process, I looked up and there are very strict flag laws and mm -hmm. flag rules. Okay. And if they got a flag up there and it's not the American flag and it's not, the American flag's not higher, yeah. you tap them on the shoulder and let them know. You need to alter the way your flag is Thank going. Thank you. One thing I'm yeah. interesting too is sometimes they're even tattered. A dude, yeah. get a good flag. Yeah. Don't have a worn out flag on your truck. They're at Ace Hardware. Yeah. Exactly. And they're not that expensive. They're kind of pricey. Yo. Yeah, they are. They are. I, 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 I about the That's building this body of work. That's it was. I, I had a great experience yeah. buying the flags where I went once I knew I had it. You know when you got it, right? Yeah. And then you like, okay, now I gotta, I gotta find those green shingles. I gotta find those yeah. shingles. I yeah. got to, right? Yeah. It, gets, yeah. it, it becomes like almost torturous, kind yeah. of, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, I got this idea. I call my bus, my, my best friends. I say, yo, where can I? buy American flags. Yeah. And he said, bro, you in Forest Grove, you could probably find some American flags. <laughs> and so I go, to, I go to Ace, and I'm like, where are the flags? I go in the aisle and I buy every flag. And I spent $638. Wow. And so I walk in with all these flags, and like, I'm being, I just couldn't wait. I was like, oh yeah, I'm about to get the work done. <laughs> Cause that's, all, that's the hardest thing. It's like, yo, okay, we yeah. got the material. Yeah. Now let's just work. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I'm, and I'm going up to the counter, and the lady's looking at me like she really did not want me to buy all these flags. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you can buy all the flags. I'm like, I could buy all the flags. <laughs> I'm very American. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I love America. Yes, very much so. And so I, I bought the flags. And I would just remember like just the look on everybody's face when I'm carrying nine flags, cotton, nylon, polyester, and an extra big one that like was like, I was like, oh yeah, let me get all of those. <laughs> and, um, and so yeah, it, it's, it's really, the process is fun at times, but really that's how it became a medium. Mm -hmm. It's just going to, going to work every day. Just, yeah. just showing up. Absolutely. I, 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 what you were talking about flags, I just, I, I, have, I have burned flags in my artwork, and I, and I did it, and I felt good. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, the other thing, though, is my, my partner and I were looking at, looking at, how, uh, at how, trying to you know, buy a, a house, and we were looking at neighborhoods, and I said, Baby, there are too many flags flying in this neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, that's just, it's a, it's a signal, it's a sign. Yeah. So, and then of course, and then both of us, I am black and he is not. So can you imagine us being in a, a neighborhood where there are lots of flags and trucks? Yeah. That's when America. You, oh, sorry. Okay, good, no, that's it. If, if, if you go see the show at Russo, which I hope you do, uh, Juyun has an amazing piece of the back of a Ford truck with two perfectly symmetrical, uh, beautiful, beautiful red, black, white, and blue stars and stripes on it. 
But if you stand in the right place, if you look at the back of the truck, you don't see the F or the D. You just see the O-R in the middle. I love that. Oh. Crazy. I love it. Thank you. I don't know if you thought about that because I'm kind of... <laughs> I definitely <laughs> thought about, about that. About Thank it. you. <laughs> I also find it interesting that we all like Jasper Johns and flags. Yeah, yes. I found a vintage flag 100 years ago, and I sent it to Jasper Johns when he was only like 90. Uh -huh. And he sent it back, signed to me. So I have a message. Oh, we wow. Love we love yeah, absolutely. Flag. We love flags, too. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Absolutely. Maybe. I want to ask three questions in the audience. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, you can uh, see you up first. The young lady with the stripes there. Yes? If, yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through your exhibit a little bit here. What, what, was your, uh, what was your thinking? Why did you choose these elements? And then... Um, it seems like the bedroom is the centerpiece. And I remember it is. from a previous conversation, you talking about your, your bedroom and looking out into the world. I was wondering if you could Yeah, say more about okay, well. Willie, can I repeat it really quickly? I'm going to try. Okay. She just wants Willie to walk through the show and tell her, tell her a little bit about what's going on there, about the bedroom scene and everything. One thing I want to say first, I was telling Martha and her daughter, that's my grandma's house. That, th this, this room feels like my grandma's house because it was so hot in the south. And in one of the rooms, you'll see this green wall on there and you'll see the drips coming down. So real. Yeah. It's like 100 degrees and 99% humidity. Yeah. The walls mm. sweat and it Absolutely. Actually oozes down the wall. So when you go in there, take a look at that. You got it right. Oh, okay. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So in my own little corner, it is, it, it is my house, uh, my shotgun, sh my family's house in the late 60s, early 70s, dissected in corners. And, and there's a whole play on the words. On my, it is from Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, but it's also uh, a, my own little corner. My last name is Little. It's in, and then the, when you walk through the house, you'll see the, you'll see the you walk through the, the front porch and then on the, as, as soon as you walk through, you'll see what represents the living room because it was it was decked out in mid-century modern, but that's just, that was just too much <laughs> money to, to try to do that. But I, I wanted to have the family photographs on the wall with the fame, the, the, the iconic MLK, Martin Luther King Jr. fan that every black mm -hmm. family had. It was either Mahalia Jackson or Martin Luther King Jr. or Jesus. White Jesus. White Jesus. Jesus. White, Jesus. <laughs> White Jesus. And they were sponsored by the funeral home. And sponsored by the funeral home. The back home. of it was yeah. the funeral home. Was B-board walls. So then, but then this, you are right. The, the bedroom is the place where everything happened. It is, it is a place where I sat in front of that television and watched the, I could, because the first thing, my first memory that really inspired me was the 1965 version of Cinderella when, when, uh, uh, Leslie Ann Warren with the long neck saying, in my own little corner, in my own little chair, I can be whatever I want to be. And I'm like, you know, I don't look like her, but that song was really resonating with me because I, I feel like an outcast, I feel like a misfit, and I can, but I can sit here and watch TV and go wherever I want to go, be whatever I want to be. I knew I, knew I was bigger than Pactolus, bigger than the Sticks Road where my family lived. I knew I was not better, but I knew I was bigger, and I wanted to travel through the, to the whole world by looking at, looking through at the television. If, if you can take the time to look at the, the shows that were, were edited by Kyle Miller, they will, they will tell you who I, who I am and who I became based on the television shows. My sense of humor, my sense of, of wanting to be worldly, all those things come from those 13 minutes or 17 minutes. And then I have coffee, uh, uh, Pam Greer on the, there's a story in my memoir uh, about, about the whole thing. That represented the first movie my father took me to it, and uh, it, it was yeah, PG, it was a PG movie. And it was probably in I was thirteen or fourteen. He, he wanted me to see uh, Pam Pam Greer. That's what, I, and and I was just like in awe. I thought he he was trying to make me 
uh, like girls. Mm -hmm. But I was just fascinated with how pretty she was, how her, her hair was green and the clothes. But he thought he was doing something. But I was just, it was, it was a whole, we were on a different thing. And then the other, the next room is called the little room. And that represents my grandmother's house. And she had a little room that my sister and I would go down into the little drafty room frozen in the turn of the century because my grandmother was born in 1897. And after, after church, we would go and, and uh, my, my sister, who was 18 months older, said, um, Bozo, my nickname, um, we would just, let's play girl. I'm like, I'll dress you up and you dress me up. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then it just started from, it just went far. So if you listen to the audio, you'll see that. But that's the room of, of wonderment. And then the next corner is, uh, represents me, who I became. Uh, some, of it is, it, it, some of it is experimental artwork. But uh, if, if, you, if you have a chance to listen to the audio, maybe another time, it does show, it, does, it is about the angst of, uh, of a child being teased, ridiculed, and, and having some sort of, uh, uh, almost a, uh, their, my, my religious folks' uh, version of conversion therapy. Like, you need to take, take quicker steps, I mean, uh, uh, broad, wide, wider steps, and trying to, trying to show me how to shoot a gun so I can be more like a man. Yeah. Uh, I get it, really. That's, I, so, I, I so see everything you're saying. In yeah. There. I get it. And, and I just hope that if anyone, I, if I can touch one person who lives in their, in their form of the sticks, because my form of the sticks was where I, wanted, where I was and, and where I knew I didn't want to be. But if anyone, uh, if, if they can be inspired to uh, want to change their life, then I, I, I have my, the, the exhibit was successful. Just one person. Yeah. Because being from a small town, being from a small town and being ridiculed for being different is so, it's something I relate to. Every time I see something about a misfit, I, I relate to that. And I know that this is something that people are going through everywhere. Yeah. Are we, are we, have a, 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 we have, are having an a, a awakening, but there, there still are small towns all over where people are just so lost. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that it can inspire people. Thank you. Okay, two more questions, really quick. Over here. Yes, sir. Um, first off, I just want to say I believe it's imperative for a younger audience to see what both of y'all are creating here. So my question is, how would you explore explaining your narrative of works to a younger audience? Once it, he thinks that a younger audience should see both of the shows, and how would you explain that, uh, the narrative, to a younger audience? Julian? I'm, I think that... I, I probably... I would, I, would, I would be interested in letting the children just explore on their own without even giving them any kind of parameters or direction. Um, I personally don't really enjoy explaining my art because I'm, although I can do it, I mean, you learn that in going to school and, st and yeah. getting through critiques is more of, I feel like it takes away from the viewer's experience with the work and formulating yep. their own yep. thought and their own connection with the work. And so sometimes I try to, I would be more interested rather in le asking them yeah. what they thought about yeah, the, the, the work and what they thought about, you know, lifting of the flag or just having, just feeling the weight of the flag on, on, in their hands, you know, and, and um, just seeing, just explaining what the word kinetic means, you know, just some, those simple things like that and um, open their eyes to work that and, and evokes conversation. Yeah. I think you're wise beyond your years. Absolutely. I put together a little tiny show and I uh, had a photograph of the place where Emmett Till had been murdered and the school kids came in and they asked me about the photo and I was trying to say this is a place where this young man ran into an unfortunate situation and they're like, oh, you're talking about Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, you got it. You're all ahead of me. So yep. you're, you're, you're a lot smarter than I am. Just let them do the mm -hmm. talking. That's what we need to do. You're absolutely right. Anybody? 
Oh, did you have something to add, Willie? No, I just, I mean, I agree. Just let it roll, let it roll yeah, and let then... Let them do it. And, and yeah, asking them questions is, yeah. that's the way to do it. Uh, there was another hand back in the back there. Um, so one of the things that I see in your work is a lot of um, references of past images. And I was wondering if you could talk about the historical context of black women and why they ask I'm curious about, um, like, futurism and uh, the introduction other kinds of black features and how that um, collapse of time could be integrated into your work or planning to integrate this your work. Yeah. So are you just asking you which, which both or yeah, both. Both. Oh, okay. I hope you heard what you said because it's so brilliant that I can't I can't say it. But she said there's a lot of black imagery and the black diaspora. And she's thinking about futurism and black futurism and how your work might get into that phase. Am I trying to finish yeah, okay. again? Okay, thank you. Uh, I I do um, I, every mo most of my work is about the past because I'm still trying to make sense out of it and celebrate it and, and educate people who don't know anything about about that that time period. A lot of people in here don't know what it was like for to live in the late 60s, early 70s. And I hope that I was able to capture the essence of that so that you can really get it. Because I did that with the juke joint, too. I, didn't want, I wanted people to understand what a juke joint was. And if they had never been, they would understand what it felt like. And people did go back, come back and say, yeah, I've, I have a feeling about what that is. But, but also, there are, I am in the process of looking at the black woman now, and that's exciting for me. And I don't, I don't know about, about futurism, but I know about now. So that's the only thing I, I, I know how to do well. So I guess that's it. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, in my process and like my work currently. Um, you know, I find it interesting exploring like whatever narratives are being talked about or then and now. So even when I did my body work on the Karens, mm -hmm. like that was an explorer into a similar situation. It was just like a, a, a overall stereotype or just a, 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 a and so for me, um, I don't know, like my next, body of work maybe is an exploration into like another situation that's currently going on now like like Willie said but that needs to be highlighted I think just part of me moving into the future is just telling stories that need to be told you know mm -hmm. and um you know blackface is just a this is just like the under the flag body of work is going to be a continuation throughout my life. Like I'm, I'm sure that I'll have plenty to paint about as it pertains to America. Um, there's weekly. It seems like it's something new that I can For draw sure. from. And Absolutely. so, um, you know, I my I, I hope to just like continue just to take work and and move like make work and 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 be an artist of my time. I think that's just the, the thing, just as far as moving into the future, as far as black futurism, like what does it mean as me as a black artist right now in the future, you know, but it, the future is now. And so like, how do I talk about what it feels like to be a black artist right now? Thank you, sir. Uh, again, I just want to let everybody know at Russo Lee works by Julian uh, out here and at the Portland Art Museum works by Willie. And I want to say thank you to Dustin and Blake for inviting me. I am so pleased that you did. I also want to thank Willie and Julian for taking the time out of their day to be with us today to tell us about their incredible process and the work you've created. And I certainly want to thank you folks for being here. Thank you ever so much. And enjoy your time. Thank you.